Well, thanks again for joining Lessons into Blessings podcast, where we are leveling up investors in their financial freedom by sharing stories and strategies of average people who've changed their financial trajectory through lessons in real estate. And today we are talking about financial markets. That seems to be a lot of things going on in the market that people don't understand. Um, inflation is up. Mortgage rates have been up traditionally over the past six months um, than it, where it was last year. And so I have with me Rick Flores um, from Trusted Lending Center. So he's been a, a senior loan officer and in the kind of the mortgage industry for over 20 years. And he's going to share a lot of insight with us today on kind of what's going on in the market and how investors can still take part in the market that we're seeing right now. So I'll say a quick introduction to, to Rick. Hello, everyone out there. I'm glad to be here, Tari, and just uh, excited to talk about some of these things we've been um, seeing in the news and uh, and uh, things that affect our business. And it really affects everybody's lives, whether you're an investor or just trying to pay the bills. Exactly. This type of information yep. will, um, will be important. Absolutely, absolutely. So I appreciate you uh, joining us today. Right. And uh, just to start off, because you're kind of mortgage lending, I wanted to give people kind of a difference between kind of mortgage lending and, and banking, right? Like, so if you're getting um, getting it from a bank or you're getting it from a lending institution, so. Sure, so mm -hmm. there's actually, there's a kind of a few um, avenues, if you will. Uh, I'm a mortgage broker, mm -hmm. and then you also have a mortgage bank, and mm -hmm. then you have just like a regular a bank like a depository institute that also does mortgages. Right. So um, as a mortgage broker, I'm gonna um, I'm signed up with with multiple lenders, and I can work with the consumer, uh, get their information, and go and shop their mortgage, get right. them the best rate and term. Right. Uh, a mortgage bank might be um, a, a smaller to mid sized company that is actually going to fund that loan themselves, but then they're going to sell it off to like Fannie Mae or Freddie or to the investor. Right, right. Whereas you have a big bank and they're basically going to just uh, write the loan and decide if they want to hold the loan themselves or, or sell it off. And so you just have these different structures where in my world, a mortgage broker, we're small, we're quick, um, we have uh, less overhead. So we can really um, be aggressive with our rates yeah. and we can... Um, like my company, for example, we don't charge any fees. We have low overhead. We get paid directly by wherever we place the loan. Good stuff. And as you go up the tier, it seems like the bigger the bank, uh, the more margin that's built into your rate or fees because mm -hmm. they have a lot of marketing, overhead, things like that. Definitely. That's good. I wanted to kind of just specify that difference because a lot of people, they're, they're shopping for rates and shopping for loans and, and they don't know the difference. So that's a that's a good, good clarification. So... Um, First question is really just how would you describe today's market? Kind of where are we at? I think a lot of people hear a lot of things uh, that's going on in the news, but if you could describe or summarize kind of the market we're in right now, how would you kind of kind of summarize that up? Sure. So um, as everybody knows, the the real estate market we've been just appreciating like crazy over the last couple of years, yeah. and it's kind of like okay, how long can this continue? And are we you know are we at the top of the market? Are we um, overvalued? Are we in a bubble? Um, so there's all these questions because of probably what happened back in 08, mm -hmm. right? When, yep. when that was a true housing bubble, a lot of different factors that went into that whole um, thing back then versus today. Yeah. And so while we may be um, you know, peaking, I would say, maybe at, at appreciation or at the levels of appreciation we're seeing every yeah. year, we're still in a strong housing market. Fundamentals are strong. People are still moving to Arizona. Businesses right. are still moving to right. Arizona, and there's ultimately a, a short supply of homes. So yeah. we're the the market is uh, strong. We're just probably going to be slowing in our in our growth. And it's it's good to just kind of specify that this is really the Arizona market, right? There, every market is going to be different. Every housing market is different, and and for investors, it's really important to understand the market you're investing in, whether you know how the employment unemployment is, you know, what are people still moving? Is there population growth and things like that? So that's, I'm glad you specified that. Exactly. Yeah. So with some of the factors, what are some of the factors we're seeing right now in the market? I think people know inflation is up, mortgage rates are up. You know, can you talk a little bit to just kind of where those factors are and how that might be impacting where the rates have gone? Sure. So uh, beginning of the year, rates were at, you know, still pretty much uh, historic lows. 
you know, we were seeing rates in the threes or below for like a primary residence, right. for example, yeah. and maybe three and a half to four for an investment property. Mm -hmm. And so uh, what happened is uh, the uh, first few months and then over the first six months of the year, the inflation numbers were just huge, right? Yeah. Month over month inflation was just growing and growing inflation numbers like we hadn't seen before. Right. So it is, as far as interest rates go, um, they're directly impacted mostly by inflation. There's other factors, but as, uh, as inflation numbers increase, mortgage rates have to increase. Mortgage, um, mortgages are packaged into mortgage-backed securities and right. sold as an investment. Okay. And so if inflation numbers are up, then that fixed investment's going to require a higher rate of return. And that's the interest rate that we're always looking at for gotcha. a 30-year fixed rate. So as inflation is moving up, so mortgage rates had to follow because they're trying to keep up with inflation and still create some kind of value for the investor. Got you. Um, and so where we're at now, so the Fed has finally jumped in and the Fed is finally starting to increase the Fed funds rate, which right. is um, is their way of trying to cool down inflation, slow the economy. Okay. So, um, but the mortgage markets, they're, until they see the Fed actually do something, you know, rates were just moving up. The Fed in mid-June increased the Fed funds rate by three quarters of a percent. Mm -hmm. And then just last month, um, they did they did it again. Right. So so we've got a two a, a, a one and a half percent increase. So now the mortgage markets are going, okay, the Fed is getting serious about inflation. Right. They're gonna battle inflation and lessen it. And and so Fed funds rate went up one and a half. And we saw mortgage rates actually finally I dip down that. and yeah. improved by about a half a percent. So right. Where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. If the Fed keeps uh, attacking um, uh, inflation and growth and, and increasing that Fed funds rate, then we expect to see mortgage rates continue to decline. So, okay. Yeah. So. I think that's everyone's like million dollar question. Will rates go back down? You know, they're holding out. They're sitting on the sidelines because they're waiting for that those interest rates to go back down. Um, it would be good to kind of talk about the history of kind of where the rates have been over the past 30 years or so um, and how those rates have decreased um, over the decades, right? Yeah, I had a little chart that we were looking at earlier. And yeah. uh, yeah, you go back, just to give you a perspective of where rates are now, if you go back to like the the early to mid 90s, you know, rates were at nine and 10%, right? right? Which is today is kind of unheard of. We were spoiled by rates in the two and a half, three and a half percent Very range, spoiled. Right, very <laughs> spoiled. And so, um, so what we're seeing now is that throughout the you know last few decades, we went from the tens and the nines, and then when I got in the business in the early two thousands, yeah. we were like in the sixes and the sevens, sure. and that was normal and, yeah. and a good rate. Yeah. And then we probably settled down in between you know five to seven percent for some years, and then re after that recession and the Fed just continuing to. Uh, try to stimulate the economy. Yeah. That is back in 08, the, they call it the Great Recession. Mm -hmm. The Fed um, was doing what they could to keep rates low, stimulate growth. Yeah. And so, um, and then when COVID hit more recently, they did everything they could to stimulate the economy and that kept rates extremely low right. until now we've seen, you know, inflation. But put in perspective, rates at, you know, in the fours and the fives are still great rates compared right. to if you go back just 10 years ago, 20 years yeah, ago, absolutely. when we were like in that seven to 10%, yeah. which was more the norm uh, before the more recent decade. Right. I'd say. I, I remember buying my first house in the, the early 2000 time period and seven was great. Like, right. <laughs> you know, um, I think I got an FHA rate. So, you know, it was better than the conventional rates that were out there. And so, yeah, when it dipped down that low, I was uh, in fear that it would it would bounce it would have bounced back up uh, pretty quickly. I think I had an arm. It was a, an investment property that I had, and a portion of my loan was a, a, an adjustable rate mortgage. Right. And so I was like, ah, oh, man, do I want to sell this or do I want to keep it? And um, because I just assumed, you know, the rates were going to go back up, and it it, it actually held steady and, and just went down. So. And that's the key, too, is that where people are, well, what are rates going to do? Um, you know, no one can predict the future. There is there a chance rates could move up some from here? Sure. Um, you know, the more recent two-month trend is down. Mm -hmm. And the other big thing is if you do purchase a home and you get a rate at, you know, four and a half, five and a half percent and yeah. rates get better, 
you can always refinance. Exactly. And so, um, and there's no, there really aren't too many costs to refinancing. A lot of times you can get an appraisal waiver. It's a pretty easy process. Yeah. You buy something with 5% down now, you know, with some appreciation and rates getting better, you can right. maybe get rid of mortgage insurance and also lower your rate. So the good news is you lock into a rate now and rates go up, you're happy. And if rates go down, you're happy because now you can probably lower your payment. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. That's good to know um, also because um, I know there, I, there's, a, there's a term out there like date the rate, something, I can't remember how it goes, but it, it is. You, we don't know where the rates are going to go. Nobody has a crystal ball, but you know, the assumption is that it will it will hopefully get lower um, as they kind of make some of the adjustments from an inflationary standpoint. How long that'll be, who knows? But, you know, if, if it's a really great, solid property, I think people still need to do the right analysis to make sure, like, if they're buying it from an investment standpoint, that the rents cover cover where that rate is right. currently. And then, hey, yeah, if you can refinance it, you still have equity growth. Um, Things are still moving in that direction. It's still appreciating, maybe slowing down from an appreciation standpoint. Just you know, a slight correction. I think we're seeing and a right. softening in the market. Um, but I had pulled some some Redfin uh, numbers and uh, the growth from this year to last year. I think it was still for Maricopa home prices. It's it they were up twenty two point nine percent compared to last year. So they're still relatively up. Um, the average days on market is, um, and this is mostly in the single family home space, but has uh, gone to 31 days on the market compared to like 20 days last year. And then obviously that just depends on the neighborhood because some sure. stuff was just flying off the market. Um, but now you're seeing homes with price drops, like that's increased, right? So right. people are, um, sellers are, are making concessions and they're given, you know, you know, buying down people's rates. So there, there is, I believe, a lot of opportunity because now we're, you know, your traditional investors couldn't get in, your, your MAPA type right. investors, not your institutional investors. Right. Now the, the market softening a little bit is, is given, as institutional investors are kind of sitting back and waiting, it's now an opportunity for them to kind of get in and get some properties that they couldn't they they couldn't compete really before. Yeah, exactly mm -hmm. right, and that's what I'm seeing. Um, you know, just from two months ago in the in the Phoenix marketplace or Greater Phoenix, if you will, that we're seeing you know with, with that improvement in the rates that we talked about, as well as more more options when you're going out. You're not competing against ten buyers. You might be able to get some seller concessions. So as a buyer, whether it's a primary or an investment whatever it may be, yeah. I'm seeing a, um, some of them anyways, like get off the fence and go, okay, there's more options. I can negotiate. It's not just a total take it or leave it, whatever the right. seller offers. Right. So that, that makes it more palatable for, for anybody that's going to go out and it makes, you know, can make uh, the deal make financial sense. Yeah. As well. Yeah. I'm even seeing it kind of on the multifamily side as well, as people are kind of like backing out of deals, um, you know, being second to the table now is also, Another strategy, you know, just watching the market to see, okay, when things come back on the market, maybe you're not the first to take it down, but uh, because there are some some you know people backing out of deals, you know, being second to to the property because now the 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 seller is a little bit more willing to kind of make some concessions there as well. So, Definitely, and just yeah. be ready, you know, yeah, as, uh, be pre qualified, have your you know your. Your, your cash lined Absolutely. up, have your financing lined up, and Absolutely. just be ready to yep. move quickly. And, yep. and with a lender or a broker like us, we're able to move quickly and, and get things done and, That's and, cool. uh, and you know, being available and all that. Kind of How long has it taken in general to close uh, these days? Well, so it depends on the transaction, but mm -hmm. like on a, like if you're looking at a primary residence, I mean, we could, if, if need be, you know, we can get something closed with appraisal inspection in a few weeks. Mm -hmm. um, our lenders, you know, we're in and out of underwriting in a day or two and, and conditions get reviewed right away. If you're going with some of the more niche or specialty products, mm -hmm. you know, you might be 30 to 40 days. Okay. So, so on, on the investment side, if it was, you're kind of more 30, 40. Yeah. And, okay. and if you're going with a, a t like you're just going with a regular conventional loan on the gotcha. investment side, same thing. Yeah. Easily three weeks. Okay. But as you start getting into some of these other programs, um, something called a uh, debt service coverage ratio loan, which okay. we might, we've been talking about yeah. a little bit, um, something along those lines and those investors, you're, you might be looking at that 30 to 40 day time. Okay. And that's actually a great segue because, um, a lot of investors, like I said, are sitting on the sidelines. 
can we talk a little bit about some of the creative products that are available for some of the investment deals that may be out there? Ones where, you know, hey, maybe investors have are just looking for cash flow, don't have all the equity, but they want to make the deal work from a cash flow standpoint. What would be your recommendations for that investor? And then we can talk about um, the investor that's that's looking for more, hey, I've got tons of equity in my property, and now I'm trying to determine what to, to kind of do. So we'll start on the cash flow side. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, most investors, when they're looking at an investment, you know, they want to hold on to as much uh, cash as they can, right. you know, for that next investment or just... Uh, you know, tenants can't pay the bills, whatever it may be, a personal situation, you, you know, cash is king, you want to hold on to that sure. money. You also want a property that's going to cash flow. Mm-hmm. So um, the program that we're seeing um, a lot of investors use, the reason they use it also is because they may not show a lot of income. Mm-hmm. So to get a traditional loan, you have to qualify based on, you know, if you're an investor, your tax returns and how much income you're showing. Right. However, a lot of investors get creative and they don't show a lot of of income per se, they mm-hmm. want to pay you know lower taxes. But um, there is a program out there. It's a debt service coverage ratio (DSCR) loan, mm-hmm. and basically the investor has to come in with a large enough down payment so that the property is going to cash flow, right. just you know e- break even or cash flow by a dollar or more. Right. And so what the the investor is going to require is that the mortgage, the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance payment. Um, that the rents coming in has to cover that payment. And mm-hmm. so they're not going to look at your tax returns like, what do you make? Right. They're going to look at this property. What does this property make? Exactly. And so that property, um, as long as it's um, you know breaking even or a positive cash flow, yep. that's what's going to determine. So if I got to bring in 20% down to make it cash flow, if I got to bring in 25, then that's what it takes. And a lot of investors are liking that because you know, no tax returns, no income documentation based off a credit score uh, and loan to value. And you just have to show that you have the assets uh, in the bank. Yeah. Yeah. So explain debt um, coverage service ratio, because that's something that I'd learned when I was taking down a multifamily property. I used a loan that kind of was was analyzing it based upon the debt coverage service ratio. But for a lot of investors, they may not know what that is. because they've kind of always gone the conventional side. Can you explain just a little bit more? I think you talked about it a little yeah. bit, you know, making sure that um, all of the, 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 in, the not the income, but uh, all of the, the, the housing office. exactly yeah. is being covered, but yeah. go ahead, I'll let so you explain when you, it. So when you're making payments on a house, whatever, you know, mortgage you take out, you're gonna have a, a note or a loan and you're gonna have to pay principal and interest, yeah. right? So, um, which is good on a loan, you're gonna be paying it, the balance down by, based on the principal portion. So principal, interest, property taxes, uh, home insurance are yeah. things that um, that you have to pay for that home. And then sometimes there's even an HOA. Yeah. So they're gonna look at those five uh, things. And so basically you take the annual taxes, divide it by 12 to get your monthly. Yeah. Same with the insurance, your monthly HOA. That's all gonna be your monthly housing obligation. Right. So your monthly housing obligation is $4,000, for example. Mm-hmm. So now whatever... Um, so whatever purchase price you're buying it at, you know, 600,000, whatever it may be, you've got to put enough of a down payment so that the loan taxes, insurance, HOA are lower than whatever the market rents are. Right. So you, let's say you can, you can get 4,000 in rent for that. Then, then you'd have to have a housing obligation, all those things I mentioned of 4,000 or less Okay. basically. And so, um, it's it's a good program in that it, it it's a, it, it's safe because you know hey the, it's safe for the investor they know that if something happened and we had to take back this property we're going to be able to still rent it and, sure. and cover the the obligation Absolutely. and it's also safe for the the person buying the home because you know they're 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 going to be a positive cash flow gotcha yeah. now are they taking into account uh, vacancy rates or anything like that in those Good question. Yeah. So the way they're going to determine the rents mm-hmm. is that they're going to require an appraisal okay. on the property. So, gotcha. and then the appraiser is going to go out and and come up with the market rents. Mm-hmm. So they're going to do their analysis and say what are similar properties that are rental properties gotcha. renting for. Okay. So that market rent figure 
you know, you might say, hey, I can rent this for a little bit more. And they probably even know that. Mm -hmm. And that's where your positive cash flow comes in. They'll they'll allow you to take it to like that 100 percent ratio where it's just exactly covering it. And so it's off of the appraiser's market rent analysis and your your PITI and HOA, your housing obligation has to be below the market rent analysis that comes back with the appraisal. Good stuff. No, that's yeah. good stuff. Yeah, that's 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 a interesting product. I know I've used it. I was um, a um, not a W two employee, so just making you know you, you we want to save as much income as possible. So on paper, that income maybe not qualifying, right. but if the property is a cash flowing property, then you know it makes sense. Um, question on just the 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 cash flow is um does does someone need to be occupying so you said appraiser goes out and appraises it does someone need to be actually occupying and renting it at the time no 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 it can be a it can be a vacant home and so it's interesting too because if it's a rental property and there's even an existing lease on it Mm -hmm. they're still going to go they may they may ask you for that lease but they're still going to go off the market rents and then they're going to maybe go they're always going to be conservative so yeah. that they would say if the lease was a little bit less than the market rents, they'd go off the lease and vice versa, you know, and an investor's probably going to have a good idea of what they could rent that um, property for. No, that's good stuff. No, that's, that's good. I hope there there's investors listening out there. Cause I think that's going to be a product that helps a lot of people get into, to some, um, some properties. And I have another uh, little yeah. gem of a, yeah, of a program yeah, yeah. that we hadn't talked about too okay. much before. I All know right. yeah. we traded a couple emails here, but so another one of our investors has a, um, it's basically a line of credit program. Okay. And this is for more experienced investors. So what they do is they take a look at what an investor's done over the last three years. Mm-hmm. And they say, how many homes have you acquired and flipped? Mm-hmm. Or how many homes have you acquired and fixed up and then rented? Okay. And so, you know, you got to prove that with like settlement statements, for, sure. for example, yeah. over the last three years. So okay. let's say you've done, you know, five properties, um, around $500,000 mm-hmm. each that either you you know, acquired and, and flipped for that price or that you bought for that price, et cetera. So you got five projects over the last three years, uh-huh. 500,000. So you've, that's like 2.5 million in projects. Okay. Again. Yeah. So this, um, this lender will set you up with a line of credit, um, based on all of those added up. So in this case, two and a half million dollar line of credit. Nice. And now you can go out and, and look for those fix and flips or fix and rehabs that, and they, they still require you to come in with about 10% okay. on a project. That's so, pretty good, though, you know, still. you're going out and you've got an acquisition and then improvements, let's say, of 600000 Yeah. They're going to make you come in with sixty grand. Okay. And then you're going to be able to use the rest off your line of credit. And then the, the plan is to, once it's, you know, fixed up, you right. flip it. Flip and then it and, and then you pay yeah. down the credit, sure. line of credit, and yeah. you just keep using that line of yeah. credit. Yeah. So the rate and the rates on that are going to be, you know, they're going to be higher. They're going to be... I know the last time I was looking into it, they were like in the nine to ten percent range. Okay. But it's you know you you borrow on it as you go, yeah. And you don't have to you know go apply for a new loan every time. Right, you just right. uh, you, you, And if you're not using it, you're not paying for it. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, I've used a product like that previously as well, and so yeah, that's very that's very beneficial as well. And once again, you've got to do the numbers right because as that interest rate that interest rate varies, right? Right. So you want to make sure that once again that the rents are gonna make sure it's gonna cover it, it's gonna cash flow, so that you're not in a situation down the down the line. But yeah, no, those products are. I've I've seen something very similar to that. And yeah. so the, the the idea would be that if you're gonna fix and flip it, you just you know once you once you sell it, you pay down the line. Right. If you're gonna fix and and hold it then the idea would be once it's ready and now you've done the improvements, yeah. then you go get more of a traditional loan for, for it sure. and then pay it off. And right. Cause you don't want to be holding that loan long term at, you know, nine or 10%, yeah. but to get the project done, because let's say you go find a fix and flip and you can't get regular financing right. because it, you know, it's kind of worn down or, sure. or there's problems with it appraising. And so you go, you fix it up now, now you can get a normal loan, you pay, you get that normal loan, you pay down the line of credit, and you just and you do yeah. it over and over. And that's kind of like the uh, the Burr strategy. I don't know if you've heard of that. The buy, rehab, rent, and then you refinance it, right. and you do it all over again. Right. Yeah, so that's good stuff. Um, what other things that you may want to throw out for our audience? That all of that was really good. 
I mean, just Thanks. really great. Yeah, it's good stuff. There are some there are some good programs out there. The the um, mortgage market has got creative. Like th those programs I just um, told you about, those are called like non traditional mortgages, mm -hmm. non qualified mortgages. So they don't have to go through the the gamut that like a Fannie Mae or a Freddie Mac or an FHA loan goes exactly. through that have to meet all these certain guidelines. Exactly. The investors hold those loans. They um, they know what their appetite for risk is and yeah. they set all those parameters. Yeah, basically. no, that's good. That's yeah. good. How can they find out more information? You, if you want to just kind of throw your information out, so they can like get in contact sure. with you if they need to find out more information about it. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So the best way to reach me always is my cell phone, and I have it. You know, I'm I'm pretty much available unless I'm asleep. That's just why <laughs> I like I love this business, and uh, my phone number is four eight zero. Five one six one four one four. Cool. Good stuff. Four eight zero five one six one four one four. And if you want to email me, it's just Rick R I C K at trustedlendingcenter dot com. Awesome. And we can throw that information up as well. Okay. And then, so one other uh, piece of information, you're dealing with anything in the Maricopa County area or you span any other areas? Yeah. So um, I'm licensed um, in Arizona. Okay. And so anywhere in all of Arizona, um, you know, I'd probably say 90% of my business is, uh, you know, centered in Maricopa County. Gotcha. And also, um, you know, do some stuff in Tucson up north. I'm also licensed in New Mexico. Okay. And I just got my license in California. Okay. As well awesome. so Good but stuff. most of it's uh, at this point is in uh, arizona i'm from new mexico so there's i do stuff for family and trying to expand a little bit just uh, i have a couple of uh, folks i know that are doing some investing in california as okay well. yeah. awesome yeah well thank you guys for joining us for this episode for lessons into blessings uh, make sure to tune in next time